thank you so much for being so professional and being on time this morning. So we would love to honor you and go ahead and get started. My name is Dr. Casey Bundock. I am the director for our CPDT, which is the Center for Professional Development of Teachers. And it is a joy to welcome you this morning. And it's a joy to see so many familiar faces, those of you from our pre-PD courses and also those of you returning to start in PD too. So welcome to everyone this morning. I know it's always a little bit nerve-wracking to get the semester started and to get downtown by 8.30, but you've done it and you're off to a great start. I would like for us to have the opportunity to start this morning by introducing our faculty um, and other support members that are in the room. So we're just going to go around the room and faculty, if you could let us know your name and how you'll be involved with these students so they can start to get to know us. Faculty, have we missed anybody? Okay. Um, in addition to being your CBDT director, I will also be working in PD2A LEAF. Uh, with Read 4303, so I look forward to teaching that class again. Before we get started, I want to address PD2 first and say welcome back. As we start uh, to get oriented this morning, you're going to recognize a lot of what your, the faculty are addressing you with. Some of these procedures and policies are going to sound very familiar. This is a great time for you to be re-familiarizing yourself with this information. There also have been some changes. So please don't tune out if things are sounding a little bit familiar because we do want to recognize we have some changes for you this semester. PD1, I know that you're nervous and you're thinking, this is, there's a lot going on this morning. You will be getting a lot of information this morning. First, in our general session, and secondly, you'll be going out to a breakout session with some of our faculty members, and they'll be supporting you in that meeting as well. Please know we recognize this is new to you and that you're nervous and that it is overwhelming and we're here to support you every step of the way. So feel free to ask questions and vocalize your concerns because we want to support you as you get started in your PD semesters. So we have been welcoming you, we have introduced ourselves. Let me tell you a little bit about our agenda this morning. The general orientation session, we want to again share those policies and procedures with you. We want to tell you a lot about something that's coming up that is specific to PD 1 and 2 and that's our diagnostic experiences. So you're going to have a chance in these two PD semesters to prepare yourselves for the exams that you'll need to take to become certified. <coughs> we want to make sure that you're ready to do that. You'll receive a lot of information on that this morning. We also want to let you know, we know that it's a challenge to get your degree and we're con you may be concerned about financially how you're going to handle that after you graduate. We do want to tell you a little bit about um, some eligibility for borrowers if you have student loans. We want to end our general session by talking about um, our different organizations that we have in urban education. We have some of our sponsors and some of our members here to meet with you. So we have a lot of great things that we'll be talking about this morning. So let's begin by understanding our program. Our goal for our program is to prepare you all as future teachers to work with at-risk children in campuses. This semester, you all will be working among six of our partner districts, and that includes right now Ailey, Aldine, Cyfair, Houston, Humble, and Klein. So you all will be representing those campuses and some of you are paraprofessionals and you may be in additional districts, but these are the partnership districts in which we'll be seeking your mentorship placements this semester. Let's consider our Texas teacher preparation standards. What are we driven by? What are we focused on and how do we want to make you successful? So our preparation standards are based on two different things, the TEKS, uh, Texas Essential Knowledge and Skills, as well as Texas standards, which are the exams that you'll be taking as you finish PD1 and PD2. PD2 already knows the drill about when they need to be taking these exams, so we'll be checking in with you and see how you're progressing there. Please know that you'll be taking, most of you will be taking two exams. The first is the PPR, the Pedagogy and Professional Responsibilities. So everyone in this room, we have four different certification areas represented in this room. All of you will be taking that PPR exam for EC through 12. You'll be preparing for that in PD1. In PD2, you're going to be focusing more on content. So you'll be taking a content exam based on the EC through 6 generalist, EC through 6 bilingual, 4 through 8, and then our 8 through 12 candidates, you'll be taking your exam based on your specific content area. So we're measuring these standards based on these, these exams that you'll be taking. Those are the standards to which we're adhering. Let's consider the features of what you're doing in, ter in terms of your coursework in PD1 and PD2, and later we'll see how your field work will be supporting that. In PD1, our general focus is to understand the learner. 
So when we take a look at three of our programs, our, our EC through six, general is bilingual, and our four through eight, your courses are generally going to be focusing on understanding the learner as well as content methodology. Our eight through 12 candidates, you're, be, you're looking at understanding the learner as well as classroom environment and professional roles. As you move to PD2, your coursework changes a little bit. You're looking more closely at enhancing student achievement. So for three of our program areas, you're looking really closely at content methodology in PD2. In our 8 through 12 program, you're looking at literacy, instructional design, and assessment. So that's where your coursework is focused upon. Please note, and this is the same as it was last semester for our PD2 candidates, in PD1 and in PD2, you have your courses at the university, and you also have a field work component. So you registered for your courses, and you also registered for either PED 4380 or 4381. And that will be your field work component. So you will be spending at least 60 hours a semester with a mentor teacher in the field. When you registered for that course, that means that we will be assigning a mentor to you with whom you'll be working this semester. So you'll have the opportunity to be in that mentor's classroom for at least 60 hours this semester. You'll also have a chance to teach two lessons in that classroom. So you'll be able to take what you're learning in your university classes and apply that out in the field. So this will really be getting you ready for PD3 or that student teaching experience before you go out seeking your first job. What we recommend is that you're going to be seeking those 60 hours over a course of about 10 weeks and you'll average about six hours per week. Let's consider the academic criteria when you're in PD1 and PD2. I'd like for us to consider the criteria for that now, and then later this morning we're also going to take a look at what are the criteria for certification. So you know immediately what your focus will need to be, and you can also plan for what you need to do long term. So in the PD semesters, the first thing that you'll need to do is to maintain a 2.5 overall GPA. So you'll want to make sure to keep that GPA in check. Another thing that you'll be doing is to make sure that in your PD courses, the three courses in which you're enrolled, for PD 1 or 2, you must have a C or higher in those classes in order to move on to the next PD section. So, we know you're dedicated to the task, that's why you're here, that's why you've made it this far, and we know you'll be able to secure that C or higher in those courses. So, that is going to be one of the criteria to move to the next semester. Please know that there's a few documents that can support you as you're wanting, as you're thinking back about this morning and you're getting a lot of information. Know there's a few different places where you can look to get this information. First of all, you can look on your degree plan. It's posted there. It's also in the UHD catalog. And I've also listed a link to the teacher candidate handbook. And I want to show you where that is this morning so that you can refer to that. When you go to our Urban Ed homepage, if you go to the quick links, if you go to the box on the right, and you go to quick links, you're going to see the professional development handbook here. PD2, this is a good time for you to review that handbook, to take a look at the criteria and make sure you're on track. PD1, this is a great place to start. I would advise you to save this document and to review this as you begin your semester so that you're recognizing these criteria of our coursework and of our fieldwork components. So know that that's under quick links on the Urban Ed Home. All right, another thing that we want to make sure that we are in alignment with during PD 1 and 2 is participation, preparedness, and professionalism. So you've sort of made a big leap into the PD semesters before you were just students, but now we consider you teacher candidates. So you're regarded as professionals and you prepare them in your field work. So we want to make sure, and this goes in with this last bullet point, that when we interact with one another, when we communicate with one another, it's always done in a professional manner. So Start regarding yourself in that professional manner now and recognize that all communication that you do with the, your faculty members, with your mentor, anyone out on campuses with one another, all of that communication, whether it's written or verbal, is handled in a professional manner. I've seen students from PD1 get jobs at their mentor campuses from PD1 and PD2, of course, and PD3. So know that that job interview starts right now as you're walking out onto those campuses and we are representing ourselves in the most professional way possible. I have really enjoyed myself this summer getting your placements put in place. And when I contact human resources to ask for your placements, and when I contact principals, they're saying, yes, please come back. We love UHD candidates. And I know that that's because you represent yourself so well professionally. 
So I want to encourage you to continue to do that and recognize that's one of the expectations as you're in this program. We have a few other criteria I want to share with you. And I've listed some page numbers here that will be referred to in the handbook. I've shown you where you can find the handbook. Um, and so you can certainly refer back to these as we'll also be posting the slideshow on that page as well. So along with doing well in your courses, getting a C or better, you're going to do well in your field work also. And you're going to have a chance after this general session to meet with your faculty that will be working with you in field work in PED 4380 or 81. One of the things that they'll be doing as they work with you is referred to in this first bullet. And they're going to be looking at teacher candidate criteria for field work. These are seven components that you'll be adhering to as you go out with your mentor's classroom. Are you acting in a professional manner with your mentor, with the students? Are you getting your lesson plans turned in on time? So these are things that will be represented in your field work that will be observed by your field experience instructor, we call them FEIs, as well as your mentor teacher. So you will need to have satisfactory ratings on all seven of these components. Another criteria is you'll be uh, guided by our code of ethics and standard practices for teacher educators. So we're again behaving in a manner that's acceptable as guided by the state, as guided by our partner districts, and by the university. We also have a form that your mentor and your FEI will be taking a look at throughout the semester to see if you're adhering to these professional attributes as a teacher candidate. So again, looking at how you handle yourselves professionally in the classroom. So a couple of times a semester, your FEI and your mentor will be reflecting with you about how well your field work is going. So please know in the PD semesters, we really have two sets of criteria. We want you to do well academically in your coursework, and we want you to perform well in your field work as well. So those last two slides have sort of told us how we're going to be doing that. All right. We want you to know that as you go out into your districts, all of our partner districts require background checks. So um, this is not something that the university is governing. This is something that the, our district, our partner districts are regulating. So what's going to happen is as you leave this general session and you meet with your FEIs, each of you is going to receive a background check to complete today. And those will, they'll start to run those early next week. Many of our districts have a paper background check. So you'll just be filling out a form with your FEI today. And there may be some information on there that you feel a little bit leery about sharing, such as an address, a social security number. Please know that when the FBI's take these papers from you, they're going to be put in an envelope and I'm going to take that and drop it off at HR. Nobody's going to be going through your paperwork and, and having the sensitive material sorted out in different places. Please know that that information will be secure. So if you have a paper background check, you will be completing that today. Some districts require an online background background check. If you are in the Klein or Houston ISD district for your placement, your FEI today will be giving you a checklist of how you can complete that online background check. They're going to request, if you're in HISD or Klein, that you complete that background check by this Monday. And the reason we want to ask such a quick turnaround is because it takes a few weeks to clear you, and we want to make sure you can get into the classroom as soon as possible. So when your FEI asks you to please have that turned in by Monday, submit it online by Monday, please make sure that you have that somewhere in your schedule in the next few days to get that done. So please know that all of our partner districts are on board with doing a background check. This is good practice because as we get into PD3, you will still be required to do a background check. And of course, as you all are seeking your jobs, of course, the district will require a background check. So they want to um, have the best interests of their students in mind. All right, previously we had mentioned the criteria we need to make sure we're adhering to while you're in PD1 and PD2. Let's also make sure we understand, well, I am in line for getting my certification. What's the bigger picture here? What do I need to make sure that I'm doing along the way? Because you're very close to finishing the program at this point. So again, you're going to be maintaining that 2.5 GPA. You're also going to be completing all of your course requirements. So that will be specific to your faculty members and you're going to make sure that that's occurring. Again, we're referring on that third point to passing the field work component. So that, those are going to be those seven criteria again that your FEI and your mentor are guiding you with. You also want to make sure that you're um, adhering to the components of our academic and professional policy. Uh, you're also going to pass 
your exams, including the PPR and the content exams, and bilingual candidates, you saw also have the BTLPT exam. So in order to be certified, you'll have all of these exams under your belt. You also will not have any holds. You'll be ready to get out of here. You won't have any holds at UHD. You will certainly not be on academic pro probation because your GPA is going to be stellar. And these are some of the final steps as you're going to be recommended for certification. You're going to apply for recommendation through SBEC. Um, you're going to submit a letter of recommendation to our department. You'll be able to earn your degree. And again, here's a reminder to our bilingual candidates that you will also need the BTLPT. <coughs> So, uh, before we move on to our next item, I want to draw your attention to the full length form that you have in front of you. As I'm going through some of these items, when, if you're feeling comfortable with this information, such as talking about the criteria for PD 1 and 2, you can sign and date that, that we talked about that. If you're feeling comfortable about uh, program completion and certification, you can sign and put your name next to that and the date, pardon me. Um, and so this is something that we're just kind of kind of keep track of as we go throughout this general session that you can sign off that you've received this information and we've also noted there's some page numbers in the handbook if you'd like to have more information about any of these topics so we know what's required of you in PD 1 and 2 we know what we need to do for certification and we know along with that academic work we're moving into the field and we're going to be going to be doing a background check to get that completed also, while I'm thinking about the paperwork that you have in your hands, many of you also picked up that half sheet for a UHD ID. PD2, I think most of you probably already have your UHD ID. When you all go out onto your mentor campuses, you will be required to have a form of identification. And we want to recommend that you're going to wear your UHD ID on your body so that you don't have to scan your driver's license every time you go in the building. This way that the faculty, the staff, and the students can recognize who you are and where you belong as you come on the campus each day. Some of you may already believe that you have a UHD ID. We're not referring to the credit card here. I know some of you have received a, some kind of credit card and it has your photo on it, you have it through UHD. That's not something you want to wear on your body. We want that information to be safe. We, won't, we don't want you to you know, lose that or have that be damaged. This is something a little bit different. So if you take that form, um, up to the one main building, I believe it's on the second floor, um, you'll be able to have your ID made. And I believe it's $5. And so this is what you want to have. It's specified on that form for student teaching. We know you're not a student teacher, but we, they handle the IDs in the similar format as you would for PD3 or student teaching. You have to go to the register to, to pay for it first on the third floor, and then you go with your receipt to the second floor for student services. And at that point, you will be they'll take your picture and the wait time is usually very short to pick it up. Thank you. So, um, since you're on campus today, that might be something that you want to just get out of the way after your breakout session, but do know before you're going on a campus to meet with your mentor, you'll want to secure that UHD ID that you can wear on your body and it doesn't have the credit card along with it. All right, we're going to jump into something a little bit more specific. <laughs> Before now, we've been taking a look at some general guidelines and criteria that we want to follow as we're in the program. I would like now to talk about something that you're going to be doing specifically this semester and it will follow you into the next semester as well. These are what we call our diagnostic experiences. So we're recognizing that after PD-1, you're ready to take an exam. It, it's your PPR exam. And after you finish PD-2, you'll be ready to take your content exam. In these semesters, we want to make sure that you're feeling prepared for that. We want to make sure that you're ready and confident to take those exams. Our goal is that you have all of your exams completed before you become a student teacher. Because student teaching is a rigorous semester. We want you to be able to focus all of your energy on that experience, and at the end of the semester, you'll be ready to interview. Because you'll have all of your exams in place, and principals are ready to hire students that have their exams completed. So that is our goal for you. So you're going to hear the faculty say many, many times this semester, as soon as you're done with this semester, you're going to take your exam. That's specific to your PD section. So let's talk about how we want to support you in that endeavor this semester. We have something set up called the diagnostic experiences. You take one diagnostic experience or exam at the beginning of your semester to see how much you know. And then you take another exam at the end of the semester to see how much you've grown. So let's take a look at the purposes of these exams. So the pre-diagnostic is required. All of you must take this exam 
at the beginning of the semester. When you take this exam for PD1, you're going to take your PPR exam. I know right now you're thinking, I don't even know what that is. What do I study? That's okay. This is just a chance for you to see how much you know. Some of the things on the exam you will know from previous coursework. A lot of the things you're going to feel like you need some support. And that's great because you're in the classes to support you for that content material. So it's going to help you understand your strengths and your weaknesses, what you still need to work on. It's going to help you with your test taking skills because what we're going to do along with our colleagues in testing services is to mirror that testing situation as closely as we can. It's going to look just like when you go to sit and take your actual exams from the state. It's also going to inform your professors. When we get your results back, we're also going to see your strengths and weaknesses. And we're going to say, oh, this group is doing well on this. This is what we really need to work on. So it's to help you all in your study and it's to help to guide your professors in their teaching and your coursework. So the goal is to enable your success. And so we want to guide you through these experiences. At the end of the semester, we'll have a post-diagnostic experience. So this is your final preparation for your Texas exam. Again, we're looking at your strengths and weaknesses. We're looking to see how much you've grown. And we're looking to see your target areas for remediation. What do you still need to work on? PD2, tune in. This is new. If you take the pre-diagnostic in a couple of weeks, whether it's PPR or content, and on the pre-diagnostic you score 80% or greater, you have the option not to take the post-diagnostic. So that would be considered a passing score. So you might say, I feel really confident about this exam, so I'm going to elect not to take the post-diagnostic. Some of you that get that 80%, however, may say, well, I'm glad I did so well, but I really want the extra preparation. I'm going to go ahead and take that exam. We're going to give you that option. So on the post-diagnostic at the end of the semester, if you had an 80% or greater on the pre, you can choose to take the exam or not. So that will be up to your discretion and how comfortable you feel in moving forward to that actual state exam. Does all this apply to the content and PPR? Yes, it does. It applies to both PD1, uh, PPR and PD2 content area. All right, so let's find out a little bit more about the diagnostic experience. Some of you may have already received an email about this this morning, and you may be wondering, well, what exactly is this? What's going to happen is during today, during the course of today, before the close of business, you will receive an email from testing services, and it will be your admission ticket for the pre and post diagnostic, and in a moment, I'll show you what that looks like. So let me tell you how you'll be paying for this exam and how you will be registered, and if you're having concerns about that, how you can someone. So on August 16th, testing services assessed a fee to you on your, on your bill for the semester. So that bill would have said something to the effect of urban education diagnostic experience. So if you had a $40 fee and you were wondering what diagnostic experience is, now you know. Um, this is your pre and post diagnostic for the semester. This fee must be paid by August 30th in order to take the exam, which is required. So if you've not yet paid anything towards your bill, you'll want to make certain that you are starting to pay toward that bill so this $40 is covered by August 30th. If you happen to pay everything already, you'll want to go back and make sure that that $40 was included. Maybe you paid before August 16th and then the $40 was added. You'll want to make sure that you've addressed that $40. So you can go online to eServices and check in with your account and see what your status is toward paying that $40. So no, mark on your calendars, this $40 needs to be paid by August 30th. So um, there's not any extra step you need to take other than just making that payment. Next, you'll receive an admission ticket via email. PD2, last semester you registered on your own. Please know that's not occurring this semester. Testing Services is sending your admission ticket to you directly. And I'll show you what that looks like in just a moment. It's going to tell you the date, the time, and the location of your exam. So some of you will be testing here, some of you will be at Kingwood, some of you will be at Northwest. They're really sort of looking at where you're taking your classes and seeing where you might be able to go to take your exam. Some of you may get your admission ticket and you might say, oh my goodness, on that testing date, my brother's getting married in Dallas. I can't be here. We know that there are 
issues that are going on. We all have lives outside of school and that there may be some conflicts. If you have a conflict that you don't think that you can get out of, there is a way for you to make a request for a change. You can contact uh, Dr. Farmer. I put her email here. She would, she's in testing services and she would like to be contacted directly at farmers at uhd.edu. And you can note that this is about the UE diagnostic experience. And I will show you at the end of our session where this PowerPoint will be posted online if you need to refer to this slide later and get Dr. Farmer's email. So please know, I know some of you may be feeling nervous right now that I may get an admission ticket where that date and time doesn't work for me. Please know that you can appeal to Dr. Farmer with the request. Now this doesn't mean, mm, I really don't know that I want to do that. Maybe I want to do the next day. This is really for students that have a true conflict because there's only going to be a limited number of seating in each of these sessions. So please do only co contact Dr. Farmer if, if there really is truly a conflict. We ask that you do that, please. So we know what the diagnostic experience is and why we're taking that. We recognize our $40 fee has already been assessed to the bill. We know that you'll be receiving the admission ticket and should you need to appeal that date and time, you have the option to do that. Let me show you, uh, before I get into this next slide, what a sample admission ticket would look like. Okay, I know this may be a little bit blurry, but let me hit some of the high points here. It's going to tell, it's going to have your name, it's going to have your ID. You can see under um, the pre and post, it's noting the date and time for both the pre and the post. So the pre-diagnostic is going to be occurring on September 6th and 7th, and then we see the post-diagnostic occurring later in November. It's going to tell you where you're going to be attending. So this pretend student, which is me, will be attending here at UHD, and it gives the room number. Some of you that are taking classes at Northwest will be tested there. Some of you that are taking classes at Kingwood will be tested there. Um, also note, it says what to bring and what not to bring on the testing day. I'm about to go over that on a slide, but I want you to recognize that this is all going to be on your admission ticket, so you'll have access to that. So this is a pretty straightforward document. I think that you'll be able, as you receive this, you'll be able to, to know what it is that you need to do. For the um, $40, does it cover the pre and post? Yes, the $40 is for the pre and the post test. You will, not, you will not be assessed another fee during the semester. But what if you don't take the post, if you get the 80 percent more? Testing services is wanting to leave the $40 <laughs> Uh, for all students because you can't elect to take it or not for the post. So we're sort of looking at that option as you, that you get the set for, the, for everyone else. It's sort of like the second test is for free. You pay for the first and the second test is sort of like an added bonus. So whether you're taking the post or not, every student will still be assessed that $40 on their bill. Thank you. So if we received the admission ticket, that means that it didn't come out of our bill right? I'm sorry, could you say that again? If we received the admission ticket, that means that it's already paid for it's not. Thank you for asking that. Uh, if you receive the admission ticket, testing services is acknowledging that you're enrolled in PD 1 or 2 and that this is the admission ticket you'll need to get into the test, but you still need to pay. So, great question. You, it's a two-step process. You will receive your admission ticket, but you also still need to pay. So, if you receive a ticket, that means you've been billed and you need to pay that bill. Thank you for asking. All right, so let's talk about on the actual testing day, PD-1, hang on with me, I know this is a lot of information, but it's information that you can review and that your faculty will be supporting you with in the weeks leading up to this so that you're able to understand and move through these steps um, and you'll be comfortable with that. So, we know you, you've paid your bill, let's say you paid that $40 by August 30th, you have your admission ticket already after today. If you have questions or concerns, you're contacting Dr. Farmer before August 30th, she will not make changes after August 30th. So if you're looking at your calendar right now and saying, uh-oh, that's not going to work, you need to let her know as soon as possible. So you've paid, you have your admission ticket. Here's what we do on the day of the test. You need to bring a few things with you. You need to bring your printed admission ticket. You must have a paper copy. They will not let you in without a paper copy. So I know we're all used to having our phones, here it is, on my iPad, here it is. The dilemma is, when you go to test with the state, you can't bring in any electronic devices or a phone or iPad or anything. We're mimicking that format here. You will not be able to bring your phone in. So you must have a, your printed admission ticket when you go into the exam. Please plan ahead and print that ahead of time. 
You will also have a non-expired, non-damaged, government-issued photo ID, and I'm reading that because I want us to be clear. You may not bring your UHD ID. Again, we're mimicking those state testing procedures, and when you go to take your actual exam, they're not going to accept your university ID. So we want to make sure, since you're going to take your exams so soon, at the end of the semester, we want to make sure that you have a government issued ID that is not expired or not damaged. So we are going to mimic that experience here. What that generally is going to look like is your driver's license. If you don't have a driver's license, maybe you have a passport. If you're thinking in your mind, oh my goodness, I don't know what I'm going to use, please contact me as soon as possible and we're going to work that out for you. But you need to know that at the end of the semester, you will need to have non-damaged, non-expired, government-issued ID to take your actual exam. So if you don't have that in place, please, please get that in place as soon as possible so you'll be ready for your exams. You also want to bring plenty of sharpened pencils. Those are the only things you can bring into the exam. PD-1, I know you're probably thinking, this sounds a little bit crazy to me. It might, but we're just mimicking the state's procedures. We want to get you ready, however crazy it is or not. We want you to be ready. So when you walk in, all you have is this, your driver's license, and some pencils, and your car keys. Ladies, I know you're thinking, where am I getting my purse? This is something you want to plan for ahead of time. I know when I have situations like this, when I leave home, I put my purse in the trunk, and then when I arrive at my destination, nobody knows my purse is in my trunk, and I can get it later. So plan ahead, think about how you want to be safe, and how you can get into the testing situation with just these materials, because as it's noted on the bottom of this slide, testing services doesn't have anywhere for you to store your things. So please plan ahead. There's a big list of what not to bring. So really it's everything else. Don't bring your personal belongings, wireless communication, copying devices, listening devices, hats, digital watches, alarm watches, or wristwatch cameras. Do not bring notes, dictionaries, books, or any other unauthorized testing aids, mechanical pencils, pens, highlighters, rulers, or calculators. Do not bring food, beverages, or tobacco products. So I think we're very clear. Just show up with your admission ticket, your ID, and your business, and you'll be ready to roll. All right, so we know how to pay. We know that we're registered. We know what to bring on the day of the test. We are ready for this. Here are the dates and times. If you've not yet received your admission ticket, I'll just give you a little preview here. Um, on that left column, it shows the locations and the dates and times. So if you'll be testing downtown, it will be on September 6th or 7th. There's a morning and afternoon session. If you're at 249, which is Northwest, or Kingwood, there's a Saturday session at 8 a.m. And the sessions are similar for the post-diagnostic. For the purposes of testing services, we have the, your test numbers listed to the side. So you may see a number there you're not familiar with. Please know that's just in reference bless you, bless you. to the courses that you're taking. So a lot of you will have the number test number for PPR. Some of you have testing numbers for your content exam. So know that's just a reference to the exam that you're taking. All right, so here are the procedures we've outlined. Recall that your student, you, each of you, your pre and post diagnostic scores will be reviewed during these semesters. So, if you score an 80% on the pre-diagnostic, remember, you're not required to take the post. So, let's pretend that you don't score that 80%. You have less than 80%. You will take the post-diagnostic. The third point, let's think about the post-diagnostic. Let's say you take the post. If you do not score an 80% on the post, we still want to make sure that you're feeling ready and confident in taking your actual exam at the end of the semester. So, we want to offer you some review sessions. We at UHD will offer some review sessions. We'll recommend some other review sessions you might attend. We're also going to ask that you do an online review. And if the time comes at the end of the semester and you don't make that 80% on the post, we're going to provide those directions to you on how you can take those review sessions and how you can do this online review. So that will be a requirement. You will need to be doing some reviews before we can recommend you for your actual testing. So, we want to make sure that we have all of these steps in place to make sure that you're comfortable and confident in taking your exam at the end of the semester. Alright, so let's make sure we understand where you're going to be at the end of the semester. If you're in PD-1, if you meet the criteria, if you're doing well in your classes, in your field work, in your diagnostic, you are going to take the PPR after PD-1. If you're in PD-2 and you haven't taken your PPR yet, I know that you're going to go out today and register for that. 
Um, and your faculty will be after you. I know that my students know that I'm after them. Um, because we want you to be successful in completing your exams before student teaching, we know the value of that. Our students, our former graduates, have seen the value of that and being able to focus on their student teaching and being able to get their job right away because they have all of their exams passed. So PD1, at the end of the semester, you are going to take the PPR. And PD2 will tell you that they are, have either taken it or they're registering, they're ready for that. In PD2, when you all finish your semester, you are going to be taking your content exam. After the semester, you're going to be ready. You're going to do that before student teaching. So when you need to seek approval to register, that's contingent upon your successful block or PD completion. Your faculty are going to be recommending you, and you have to complete those pre and post diagnostics. So everything is in place before Ms. Hill is able to make that recommendation for you to take your exam. Today, when we break out of the session, you're going to meet with your FEIs. They're going to have a form for you to fill out that's going to be a request to register for the Texas exams. So we're going to give those to Ms. Hill, and as these pre and post are passing, and at the end of the semester, she's going to be able to recommend you for that exam. So you're going to even begin preparing for that today. So based on that approval, you can take your exams at the end of the semester, or it may be right at the beginning of the next semester. Our rationale for this is that it gives you the opportunity to be successful on the Texas exams as soon as you're done with your coursework. You may feel nervous and uncertain, but you're going to be ready. Your faculty are here to support you and get you ready for these exams. So we all feel nervous when we have exams to take, but know that at the end of these semesters, that is when you're going to be most ready, and that's what we want to support you in doing. It also gives you all the opportunity to pass all of these exams before your student teaching, so you can focus on that. Okay, so that's, uh, uh, yes, Ms. Dr. Bajar. Uh, I wanted to also mention that one of the things that we kindly recommend is that you start budgeting for your uh, exam. Because those exams are not Thank you. inexpensive. Uh, so I always tell my teachers, start budgeting uh, for that. Because at the end of the semester, you will have accumulated some money to be able to go ahead and take the exam and pass. Thank you so much. Ms. Hill is at 120? Yes. $120 per test. So that, Dr. Petrona, thank you so much for reminding me. But it is important to start planning because that is a lot of money. So each time you take the test or if you have to retake the test, it is $120. So plan in advance. I just wanted to also mention that in September 1 of 2014, the content exams are changing. Um, so I highly recommend that PD1 and PD2 students, as you finish your PD2 semester and you are eligible to take those content exams, to do so. You now have to pass that content exam with a scale score of 240, okay? As of next September 1, you have to pass every content area of the exam. So right now, if you're not so great in science or social studies, you can still pass the entire test. But as of September, you have to pass English language arts reading, you have to pass math, you have to pass science, you have to pass social studies, et cetera. You have to pass every domain to get a passing score on the content test. Okay. So September 1 of 2014, which will be right after your meeting twos. Okay, so I want to just encourage you to be ready to take that content so you can get that out of the way when you're eligible. If you fail in section? No, if you fail a section right now, the state is saying you'll have to retake the entire exam. The if that changes, I'll let you know, but that's what the state is saying right now. So if you take the content and you, you fail the math section, you have to retake the entire exam. Mm -hmm. Another $120. For those that are taking it, let's say this fall, right now, this fall, fall yeah. and this spring, you're, you're still So ready. now is the time. The moral of the story is don't put this off. <laughs> So when, let's come back together, ladies and gentlemen, please. When your faculty are harassing you, practically, not truly they won't, but they're really going to be adamant about, please take your exams, you're ready. They're serious. We want you to be able to have this experience, to take this exam, the exam right now. If you put it off and put it off, you'll be taking the exam, as Mrs. Hill mentioned, where it looks very different than it could look for you 
right now when you're done with PD2. So PD2, finishing the semester, plan on taking your exam immediately. In PD1, you'll know that you'll be looking forward to doing the same. I just like to add that you want to take it right after you're done because that's when the information is most fresh. Mm -hmm. The longer you wait, I always give the example of a friend of mine when he finished law school, he decided to he decided to wait. And he's the only guy of his generation from, from his graduating class from the University of Texas who has not passed his law degree. Mm -hmm. All that money, 13 years later, he still hasn't passed it. Mm -hmm. Because he waited a whole year. A whole yes. Thank you for that example. The, the other component is right now, the generalist, I believe, is 100 questions, 120 mm -hmm. for the generalist. It will be 200 questions mm -hmm. in September. Mm -hmm. So that they can equally distribute questions for all the content areas. So I think we've provided motivation for you. <laughs> 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 You're ready. Um, I also had a personal friend um, previously, before you all had EC through six certifications, EC through four. And she decided, I'll put it off, I'll put it off, it's no big deal. Well, in the meantime, certification changed. She had to go back and do several undergraduate classes and attain her EC through six. So if you are putting things off, not only will the test change, but perhaps even the certification. So we, want, we know that you're prepared. We know that you feel nervous about taking tests, but know that you're prepared and you'll be ready to do that. So I just want to clarify, because sometimes students have this question. It is possible for you to complete our program and earn a degree and not be certified. If you have taken the exams and not passed the exams, if you have a degree, but I want to ask you a question, will the school districts hire you with a degree only? No. You must be certified in order to be employed. And so this is another big reason why we want you to be successful in our coursework, but that second piece, the certification, is so critical for your job seeking uh, and, and employment. So remember that. Thank you so much. Uh, don't, don't, don't be fooled by those who say, oh, I'm not going to be certified that I can be hired by what we used to call emergency permit. Those are very, very rare exceptions. Mm -hmm. If you hear some of your friends say that, don't listen to them. Because <laughs> I mean, those are usually under very, very rare circumstances. Usually, the mixture, what they do is they will hire somebody that is certified in science to teach math, and they will give them an emergency permit. If you are just a college graduate and do not certify, forget about it. Yes. So, we know that you want to take your exams as soon as possible. I think we've given you some motivation to move on that this morning. So, PD2, if you don't have that PPR, I know you're going to run out and register for that this morning. So, you now know about the diagnostic experience. You know that you have the fee that will be assessed to you that has been. You know that you'll be receiving your admission ticket. You know what to do if you need to appeal that. And you know what to bring or not bring on the day of the exam. So what I'd like to move on to next, I want to tell you ahead of time, I'm just barely going to touch on this because I want you to be aware of this information, but this is not my area of expertise. We want to recognize, um, as, as a UHD faculty, that we know the challenge of getting a degree and being in the workplace and having loans. We know that's very taxing. We know that that's worrisome. So we want you to be aware of a program called Teacher Loan Forgiveness and how you might be eligible for this. So I just want to give you some a very brief bit of background information and a contact person if you're thinking, this sounds like something I need to know more about. So what will occur is that as you are going out and seeking your jobs, many of you are going to be going out into urban education, urban campuses, at-risk campuses. Uh, you'll learn that these are called title campuses. So as you go out onto these title campuses that we're all working with in your mentor placements anyways, many of you will be seeking jobs there. Those of you that are working on these at-risk campuses, if you have loans, you may be eligible for teacher loan forgiveness. So let's consider that as you know you're going to be hired shortly, if you're going to be hired at an at-risk campus, what options you might have. So 
in order for you to qualify as a borrower, you must teach full time for five consecutive complete academic years. So think about when you graduate, you're hired at this at-risk campus, this Title I campus, and you're going to teach there for five years at this low SES school or this at-risk school. That would make you eligible for teacher loan forgiveness. So what that's going to look like, what would happen is you're teaching these five years. On the fourth year, our contact and financial aid, her name's mentioned here, Megan Lane, she said what you can do within that fourth year is you'll be applying for teacher loan forgiveness, looking forward to that fifth year, which is that, the criteria. So um, as a borrower, you have the option within this program to appeal to them for loan forgiveness, which is receiving up to $5,000 towards your loans. So we know most of you are going to be on these at-risk campuses anyway. If you have loans, know that you have the option for loan forgiveness. You could receive up to $5,000 towards your loans. So we want you to keep this in mind for the long term. Some of you, especially our 8 through 12 candidates, you may be eligible for some more money because there are some areas of high need, such as we, they're looking for highly qualified math or science teachers, as well as uh, special ed teachers. So these are areas of high need. You may be eligible up to $17,500 in forgiveness. So because these are areas of special need. So we want you to just be aware of these options. We know many of you have loans and you're wondering how this is all going to work out once you graduate. Know that you have options. Our contact here is Megan Lane. You may want to contact, uh, write down her email. She is extremely helpful and can give very um, down-to-earth information for any of your concerns. She also has information on other financial aid options. Um, I think this is her maiden name, Benedetti. So it's Benedetti M at uhd.edu. If this is something you're interested in, please stop, jot down her email and know that even after you graduate, maybe you've had friends who graduated, she will counsel graduates as well. So please know that this is an option for you as you're recognizing that your program here is nearly done. All right, so here comes a really fun part of our morning orientation, and that is that we would like to be able to introduce you to some of our organizations that we have on campus. Um, we have four organizations that are represented this morning that would like, we have some with representatives here that would like to talk to you and tell you a little bit about the organization and invite you to join them. So I believe Dr. Pinkerton, would you like to address the group? Sure. Great, come on up. She's going to tell us a little bit about the Urban Educators Literacy Society and how we can join and what they have going on. Um, okay, so this year, Dr. Dalton and Dr. Wade and I are sponsoring the Urban Educators Literacy Society. And we are an organization where you can join us for literacy professional <coughs> development and some fun activities related to literacy. Um, for the fall, we have a few things scheduled that you might be interested in. Um, Dr. Van Horn does a lot of work at the House of Tiny Treasures, and she takes our UELS members with her to do work there. We also have some authors who are coming to the Houston area and you can go and visit with them for free. Um, and in fact, I'll mention who it is. RJ Palacio wrote the book called Wonder, which is a fantastic book. And also the Newberry Award winner from this year wrote a book called um, The One and Only Ivan, and she will be here too. So that's on our list of things to do. We also have some conferences um, Tave, um, the bilingual educators, will have a conference in Houston this, this semester, and also the, how, um, the Early Childhood Association of Houston, they will have a conference here in Houston too. And at the end of the semester, we will meet for dinner to talk about the Hunger Games, all three books in the series, and then we will go see the movie together because it comes out in November. So it's going to be really, really exciting. We did it a few semesters back when a Another little book called Twilight came out with a movie. Um, and we had dinner and movie and book club discussions and all that fun stuff. So if you're interested in joining, I have membership forms. Um, it's very, very inexpensive to join the ELS. If you're interested in joining, I have membership forms I will leave out on the table outside and also have that calendar of events that I was mentioning. And we also have copies of all of that upstairs in the um, Urban Education Office too. So I hope to see you guys, and I was going to say too, if you're interested in serving 
this organization in a little bit of a higher capacity. We're looking for a couple of officers for this semester too. So if you want to join us and take a larger role in the, in the group, then contact me. We'd love to have you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Okay, Katie Pye. Dr. Perjana, are you going to be addressing our group this morning? Yes, Thank you so much. Also. I have had the pleasure of working with KDP for several years, and our enrollment has increased steadily. And this year, Dr. Burnett is going to be the lead counselor, and she will be working with Dr. Dalton. But I really urge you to consider this um, joining our organization because it is based on GPA and it's highly, highly uh, valued by principals out there who are doing hiring. So I'll go ahead and turn it over to that person. Okay. Um, thank you. So Catholic Delta Pi is an international honor society in education. Um, so you do have to have a specific GPA, which I believe is 3.0, um, to be initiated into the chapter here. Um, the deadline, if you're interested and you're not sure if your GPA is high enough, but you think I might be there, you know, go on and fill out the form. Okay, so there's a preliminary form that you can find on our uh, Urban Ed website. If you go under the Quick Links part, you'll see a line that says student organizations, you can find it under there. Or if you go to the Urban Education, the Urban Ed, our department website, on the left-hand side, there's a line that says deadlines. You can click on that, and then you'll also, and then scroll to the bottom of the page, and you'll see the, it's the preliminary form, so we can go in, check your GPAs and such. And you also need to have at least 12 credits in education courses, okay? Um, just like the, Urban Educators Literacy Society. We're also looking for officers. So our officers, they will get to, so currently our president is needs to spend more time with, she's in PD3 now. So she needs to spend more time with PD3, so we need to get some money in there to transition so that when she's completely out, we'll have that person ready to take over. Okay, so if you're interested in that, you can contact myself or Dr. Paul. Thank you. Hang out here, Dr. Paul. I know, I know. <laughs> Tell us about ASC <laughs> All right, so um, I also work with ASCD. This is an organization, I think it's one of the only or one of the few student chapters just in our area or with the association. Even though it says, and I want to say that, even though it says Association of Supervision and Curriculum Development, it's really about a networking and educators any type of educators in the field. So we're talking about principals, teachers, uh, what else, us, ourselves, uh, professors, different people in the education field. So really it's about networking. Um, we like to get our group together. So if you're interested, also contact me because I have to give you uh, little codes. So if you're interested, contact me. I also get an idea of who wants to be involved and so that we can see where we're gonna plan our meeting. So you guys, of course, probably would be interested in having meetings here, but we also have people at the, um, the 249 campus as well as the Kingwood campus. Okay. And again, we need enthusiastic, active participants so that we can you know, start it up for the semester. And also ideas for um, uh, service projects. So again, just contact me. Our name, our emails are usually just our last name, first initial at UHDSU. So I'm Burnett C at UHDSU. Thank you so much. The last organization we'd like to share with you this morning is BASO, our bilingual educator student organization. We're so glad BASO now not only is welcoming bilingual educators, but also ESL. So really all of us could be members of BASO. Our sponsor is Dr. Bhattacharji, but I know we have some officers from BASO this morning that would like to address the group. So I invite you all to come forward. And also we want to thank BASO for providing refreshments this morning, cookies and water. So if you weren't able to enjoy that on the way in, please make sure to get some on your way out to your breakout session. Thank you, Dr. Bondat. Hello everyone, my name is Pam Alfred and I am the current president of our BASO organization. It is a joy and as Dr. Bundock has said, you do not have to be a bilingual uh, student to be involved in this organization. As a matter of fact, it's now open up to ESL and any of the other EC through 6 generalists or 8 through 12. Uh, some of the things that I wanted to highlight this morning 
or to be an active member, you must participate in uh, at least two activities and have 10 uh, hours in some kind of outside um, activity that we have. Uh, our fees are $15 per long semester, which be the fall and the spring, and that will carry you through the next semester. We have three upcoming activities that we would like to invite you to assist us in. Uh, one of those would be coming up next week, our welcome week at, the, at our main campus. If you are able to assist us, please see me after the meeting. Also, we had this weekend uh, one of our sponsors, PBS, they are having their Daniel Tiger uh, event at the Houston Children's Museum. Uh, if you're interested in that, come and see me as well. And September 21st and 22nd, we are honored to host um, our Puerto Rican and Cuban Festival every, every year, downtown area. We volunteer and we work with them, not only those organizations, but with Tabe. Uh, we have the Beso Institute that's coming up in October. We will uh, sponsor, I believe it's five students from the university, 100 students across the state of Texas. Uh, college students will be there, and then of course 50 uh, high school students. But they've reserved spots for five people. If you're interested in that, there's a $20 um, deposit. deposit, thank you and um, they will open it up to other students. So we have a lot of things going on. I'll have a table, maybe over in the corner or something, and I do have applications if you'd like to see me. And that's it. Yeah. <laughs> say something else about the, the Basel Institute. It's going to be focusing on the Dream Act. And pretty much it's, go, it's in a very exciting program because we're gonna be looking, we will have presenters from the University of Houston, even in Dr. Flores, our president have accepted an invitation to be there. We also have the student body from the University of Houston, who is the dreamer also. He's going to be doing presentations. So the institute is really very tight and it's an opportunity for all of us. The, I understand the Urban um, Educators Association is going to sponsor some of the students also to participate. Also, VESO is doing a similar effort because we want to have a present there. This is an opportunity. We are expecting um, bilinguals and ESL teachers from all around the state of Texas. It's very well attended. It's going to be in Galleria. I'm, I'm the chair for the TAVE Institute, and I really uh, thanks very much, Pamelia. Our VESO president is also in the committee. So is Dr. Dalton and also Dr. Burnett. Everybody's been really working along with other faculty members here in the department and hopefully Dr. Herrera will do a presentation about the historical overview of immigration, the past, present, and future of immigration. So you are really invited. Um, another thing that is important is Dr. Van Horn got her presentation accepted. So this is a really, oh, Dr. Johnson also is going to be doing a presentation and I will do a presentation. So the, the, it's going to be a really an exciting experience. Another thing that we do, how we talk about that, is that we also organize the students to go to CISO and this is also very important because this is an opportunity for all of you to go and talk to TEA. Is there is any scene that you don't like or you have an input idea? <laughs> you need to go voice that there. And we do have an academy for the students also. Through VESO, join the association and you will have also all this opportunity. Also, if you are a member of VESO, we offer reviews for the BPR and the content is. And some of the students, you have already done your 10 hours and your requirement, you go for free to the review. Mm -hmm. But if not, you can still attend, but you can, you need to pay the fee. Mm -hmm. And we will let you know the fee. It's a requirement for you to have done some kind of review to be able to get the approval from Mrs. Hill for taking the test. So they accept also if you do reviews with us. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much.
All right, so you now have a bit of an awareness of some of the organizations in which you might want to take part as you're in ED1 and ED2. Sorry. Okay, guys, I forgot. Go for it. With Kappa Delta Pi, we have two initiation ceremonies. The deadlines are, they come up very quickly. So if you want to be initiated this semester, you need to get your application in to us um, no later. It's the second Monday in September. So that's right around the corner. And then it's the second Monday in February for the second semester. Thank you. All right. Okay. Just want to give you a heads up. Some of you have had email correspondence or maybe have talked on the phone with some of our advising and certification support. And we can just put a face and a name together here. Perhaps you've talked with Mrs. Sparza, Ms. Ratcliffe, or Mrs. Hill, who's here this morning. So just wanted to let you know who these ladies were that offer so much support to our program. In just a few moments, you'll be exiting to meet with your FEI, or Field Experience Instructor. So they're going to have some paperwork that you'll need to fill out to prepare for the semester. And they also have some great information that they want to share with you to prepare for your field work that they will be overseeing. Before we break, um, I want to give you a few reminders. First of all, remember that at the end of the semester, you're going to be taking your exam. It's $120. Start budgeting now. So think about how you can break that down per week or per month. Secondly, remember there are the little half sheets of paper outside of the double doors. If you need your student ID, please don't forget that. Um, third, Recall that for the diagnostic exam, you must have that current government-issued ID. If you are thinking that's a problem, I need you to contact me as soon as possible to work that out. On the way out, guys, I know you're ready. Hang on. Just a minute. There's uh, some different things we want to offer you that have just been set out. If you were interested about the loan forgiveness that I spoke briefly about, there are some brochures for you out on the sign-in tables something you're interested in learning more about, please pick up a brochure. Also, we have um, a little clip for your student ID to wear as you go out into the field. If you'd like to pick up one on your way out, again, that will be at the table. You're welcome to have one. Um, right here up, up on the slide, these are the breakout sessions. They're assigned by your FEI. This is the person that you're enrolled with for PED 4380. Or PED 4381. So if you're looking at your schedules, this is the person you need to go with. This is the person you signed in with when you came in. So you'll be meeting with this faculty member. I've put down your district and your program, hoping that will help you figure it out. The room numbers are located here. Some of you are staying here. This is C100. Most of you are going to the third or fourth floor. Please be advised. You may have seen the signs on the building saying that there's police training today. Uh, this has been going on all week. You may not go on the second floor today. They are conducting some training. It should be occurring later in the day from what I've been advised. But if you may hear loud noises, um, maybe some, I know it sounds unusual, but it's true. You may hear loud noises or some different unusual sounds coming from the second floor. That's what's going on. <laughs> Do not be alarmed. It's a police training exercise. So some of you are hanging around early in the afternoon. That's what will be happening. So, at this time, I want to invite you to move to these locations, but Dr. Bob Chargy has an announcement first. Yes. Um, I want to invite the students who are on the, the old program that we call the Florida. They will stay here and they will see me. Thank you. Also, on your way out, you're welcome to get all the papers I mentioned, but don't forget the cookies and water. <laughs> Thank you for being a lovely audience. I look forward to working with y'all, and you all may go to your FBI.